Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We come trusting that you accept us and our worship. We come in the, assur in the assurance of the love he demonstrated in his death on the cross. As we worship, keep reminding us and convincing us of your love. Soften our hard hearts and bring us to the foot of the cross that we might be prepared to carry the cross for his glory. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is Jesus is Lord, creation's voice proclaims.
Please be seated. Let's, let's pray. Father God, we come into your presence to declare that you are our Lord. We've come to give you honour and praise. We come not just because you created us, but because you came to us in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who reveals what you are truly like. We praise you for the life he lived, the teaching he gave, the way he made your love real and your truth understandable, for his death on the cross. And we praise you that through his acceptance of other cruel, others' cruel words and actions, he has made it possible for us to see your mercy, and that through his refusal to compromise with evil, we are brought face to face with your own. We praise you that through his experience of emptiness and desolation, we are given a glimpse of your home. And through his dying, we are offered the chance of forgiveness and peace. And that through his mighty resurrection, we are given the promise of eternal life. Father, our Father, we have so much to praise you for. And we do so. And will do so forever. But you know who and what we are and what we are not. You know our confusion and our folly. You know our strengths and our shame. You know those times when we profess such great hope and then so quickly lose heart. You know when we don't stand firm on what we say we believe and when we are all too ready to criticize others who fail. You know how easily we grumble and ever we go through then refuse to share one another's hurts. You know the conflict between our good intention and the ease with which we fall into the path of least resistance. You know the battles we feel to win and the ones we never quite worked out which side we were on. Help us, Lord God, in this time when we are together be brought deep into, deeper into your love and to know that we are loved truly, completely and utterly and that you can be trusted and to give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Christ died for our sins. We are forgiven and have the promise of eternal life. Feel that forgiveness in your heart. Nothing you can do will make God love you more, for you are already totally and unconditionally loved. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs> Chris is going to bring us our scripture reading. not 
can't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Well, this morning, amongst other things, uh, we're going to be thinking about how we worship. But what comes into your head when you hear the word worship? Any thoughts? God. God, yeah, that's a good start. Bowing down. Bowing down, yes. This room. This room, yeah. Sunday morning. Sunday morning, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I won't go into Rafa Nadal at this moment, yeah? Um, <laughs> song. Song, yeah. All sorts of things. And worship is the way that we give our praise and thanks and we tell and show God how much we love Him. And sometimes we do that by singing. Sometimes we'll do that by praying. But in this morning's reading, we heard about a woman called Mary who showed her love in a very different way. She took a bottle of perfume and poured it over Jesus' feet, and then she wiped his feet with her hair. And that got me thinking, what are the different ways that we show our love and worship to God? And once again, I've got some of my ducks here to help me this morning. Yeah, and the first one is my Martin Luther duck. And Martin Luther reminds me that some people will do it in quite a traditional way, that they will preach and teach in the church and they will show their love for God by doing that. And my Sherlock Holmes duck reminds me that we won't always understand things and that there are some people who are very good at unpacking the mysteries, helping us to understand more and more about God. And my Sherlock Holmes stuff reminds me that there are people who really think deeply about mysterious things and help us understand it. My Jane Austen duck reminds me that there are people who will write beautifully. They will write great hymns or they will write poetry or write books that help others draw more deeply into the relationship with God. And maybe they're a bit more quiet, whereas my Bruce Springsteen duck tells me that some people are really quite loud and rah in their worship. They really like to make a big noise. And then we, some people do it in other ways. My nurse duck shows me that there will be people who care for one another and care for the sick, and that is a way they show their love for God. <coughs> My Freud duck reminds me that Sometimes all it really needs to show your great love for God and for others is to lend a listening ear. And it may even be more simple than that. My barista duck tells me that it might just be a case of sitting down and having a cup of coffee or tea with someone and letting them know that you care. This one's the latest duck in my collection. This is my Rosie the Riveter duck from the war. She just, you know, there's some people that they really do, they may not necessarily stand at the front and preach and teach, but they just roll up their sleeves and get on and do stuff to help others. I mean, I met Martha was one of a character like that in the Bible. And others, I will just show it by being very generous in, in what they give to others. And even my Olympian duck tells me uh, that we can praise God, maybe even in sport. Eric Little, who uh, the, the, the film Charity Fire was about, used to say that when he ran, he felt God's pleasure. All sorts of ways that we can show our love and praise to God. And in fact, pretty much everything that we do 
and in a sense be an act of worship. Paul, one of the people who wrote part of our Bible said, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Do it as if God were the one that you were doing it for. And when we do that, it will be an act of worship. So there's something all of us can do to express our love. We'll all be very different, and we'll all express it in very different ways. Because God has made us all differently. But if we, whatever we do, we do it as if it's God that we were doing it for. It will be an act of worship, and will mean so much more. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you have made us all differently. We thank you that there are different ways we can show you our love. Help us to do all we do as if we were doing it for you. And do it to show our love for you and for others. Amen. So we're going to sing again. Lord, we've come to worship. Lord, we've come to pray. Into the, into the visitor as well. So, so let's not mess that up. So I guess a few notices for this week is just uh, to remind for you that they'll be meeting today at 12.45. We've got to have some lunch and uh, you can uh, yeah, and, and, and be gathering. Unfortunately, I can't be with you today. I'm leading a church meeting in Stanmore this afternoon. So to, to remind you that the Lectio course, the uh, Lent course will continue on both Monday and Wednesday of this week. Monday here at 2 p.m., Wednesday on Zoom at 8 p.m. This week is the last week of our warm hub uh, for the winter, and also, uh, and also then next Sunday we will have our Palm Sunday service. And that leads us into the fact that Easter will be coming up, and uh, our Easter, there's a list of our Easter services on the back of your notice sheet this morning. And a couple other things coming up is Ian will be leading a walk in London on Tuesday the 4th of April. And uh, if you want more details about that, please speak to Ian. But also on that day will be the funeral for Timothy Beckwith. So, and finally, uh, Chris will be walking the, uh, doing her annual walk in the aid of St. Luke's Hospice. This year, this year they're doing the Isle of Wight for four days over the May bank holiday weekend. I think that's the second one, the second May bank holiday. It's the first one. It's on the 29th of April. All right. Okay. So the 29th, 29th and back on the 2nd of May. So we're away the first one. I thought the bank holiday had been shifted a week ago. No, it's two bank holidays. Oh, come on, no more bank holidays. Oh, no, this is, this is too Life has just got so much better. <laughs> right, okay. Right, so, so that's what we're the first night I call it a weekend. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so, 
and, and there's a form on there's a form on the church notice board you can donate or you can use the just lip giving link that chris has put in all over the silos but that leads us into this really great segue because we have a very special visitor this morning from St. Luke's Hospice. And uh, Galena's come and talked to us about a particular project that they work on. But St. Luke's Hospice is an organization that we have a great affinity with. We, um, we Chris in particular has done raised so much money with cakes and jams and, and whatnot and, and the sponsored walks. And we have, the, we have a couple of coffee mornings here that support the work of St. Luke's Hospice. But Galena is here to talk to us about a very specific part of the work that they do. And I'm going to invite you to come up and uh, talk to us now. Again. Um, 
you go did a poll in 2020 um, and they asked people um, how they felt about their care, if they had to be cared for. And a huge percentage felt very, very strongly about it. Um, but when asked if they'd done anything about it, only 7% had actually written anything down in terms of what they wanted. And advanced care planning is, is about your care, should you need to be cared for by anybody. Um, but it's also about should you pass away, your wishes should you pass away. Um, we use three main tools. Um, we use something called an advanced statement, which is all about you, it's all about your identity, um, with what things are important to you, you know. Um, imagine if you couldn't tell somebody what you wanted. You know, if, for example, you had a brain injury or you had dementia or something else, some other reason that, that you couldn't tell people what you wanted. An advanced statement sets out all sorts of things about your care. Anything from, you know, you, you hate loud noises, you're scared of dogs, um, you're vegetarian, you don't want to eat any meat, or you know, anything about your care that you would want people to know. It just puts things down so that if you can't tell people, it's already written down. It also um, talks about a little bit about your medical um, information um, and also about what you want to happen should you pass away. Um, a lot of people put this in their will, myself included. When I made a will many years ago, I put all my funeral wishes in my will. But then it occurred to me that my will probably wouldn't be read until long after I've been, you know, passed away and, and been buried. Um, so it's important to make sure that people have access to the information at the right time. The second tool is um, lasting power of attorney, um, which a lot of people have heard about. I think a lot of people know about the financial lasting power of attorney, but there is also one for health and welfare. Um, and the principle is the same. It's about you nominating somebody to make decisions on your behalf if you're not able to. And the final tool is um, the advanced decision to refuse treatment. This used to be called a living will, and it's basically any treatment that you don't want to have. And it's, um, it's different from a do not resuscitate order, um, which is just about resuscitation. Um, the advanced decision to refuse treatment could be anything at all, like, for example, painkillers, if you don't want painkillers because they make you feel groggy and make you feel zoned out. Um, and you'd rather stay alert, you know, you can put things like that in an advanced decision. Now, none of these tools requires a solicitor. I'm sorry if there's any solicitors in the audience, <laughs> but none of them requires a solicitor. Um, the advanced decision and the advanced statement are completely free of charge. And the lasting power of attorney costs £82 at the moment, but is free to people on certain benefits. Those are just some quotes from people who have done advanced care plans, reasons why they, you know, would, you know, are planning ahead. Anything from not wanting to burden their family to worrying about what might happen to their pets to, um, as I mentioned before, maybe they have certain um, food preferences that they need to observe. Anything at all. Um, people generally don't do an advanced care plan, A, because they don't know about it, and B, because they think, oh, I've got plenty of time to do that. That's, you know, I can do that further down the line. But like I said before, we just never know, and it's always better to be prepared. Um, I'm sure most of you here have life insurance of, of some kind, so if you do, you've, you've already started planning for what happens when you pass away, um, because that's to protect your loved ones, you know, should you pass away. So if you have life insurance, if you have a will, you know, you've already started thinking about it. Um, this is just um, what's in our advanced statement. Um, it's just a, a brief overview. As I said, it's about you, your values, your preferences. Um, there's some practical information in there about your medical condition, if you have a medical condition. 
Um, there's information about the people who are important to you. Um, if you have pets, you know. One of my main concerns, I'm a huge animal lover. Um, I've had cats all my life. And one of my main concerns would be, you know, what happens to my pussy cat if anything happens to me? You know, I would want to make sure that, that it was looked after. Um, so it's very practical, but it's also, um, you know, it can be quite emotional to do it because of the nature of what you're thinking about. But once you've done it, I promise you, you will breathe a huge sigh of relief. This is just um, an example of a visual advanced statement. You know, if, you know, people are to be able to think, oh, that's an administrative task. You can make it more fun. You can, you can do a visual one. You can sit down one, one day with a cup of coffee surrounded by, by magazines and a pair of scissors and cut things out and, and make your own visual um, advanced statement. It's a really personal document and it's, it, it's your document. It's for you to decide how to fill it in. Um, I'll just give you a brief overview of the service that we offer at St Luke's. Um, again, I can't read, but I know what it's, I should say anyway. <laughs> um, it's open to people in Harrow and Brent, basically, at the moment. Um, that, that's not to say that it, it, it won't go further afield. We are actually working with a company called Compassion in Dying. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but they are a nationwide charity. Um, and they partner with organisations like us to, to do things like this. Um, what did I say that to? Staff or volunteers will assist with this patients. Yeah. Volunteers will provide support to people who are not patients of St. Luke's. They'll, they'll do their, their BBS check, they've got references, they have a full trip to do it. And the service is free of charge. And, uh, yeah, they be provide feedback so that they think you know, you're doing it useful. Yeah. And the community outreach involves care in residential homes, GP surgery, nursing homes, care organisations, day centres, social prescribers, uh, advisory, even my uh, eyesight's going on that, uh, advisory organisations, faith leaders, and learning disability care. Uh, so that, uh, that's, I think that's at the very outside of my <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so yes, we train volunteers. Um, Compassion in Dying does a, um, a, a training course for our volunteers in advanced care planning so that they know all about it and they can give people all the information they need. Um, we also, St Luke's, train them in the procedures for the service. Um, they're fully DBS checked, they have to be interviewed, they have to do um, online training as well um, in things like information governance and learning working and all sorts of other things. So they're very well trained. Um, they uh, basically will come out to people wherever they want to be supported. Um, we're quite flexible. Um, we can come into somebody's home. We can come to a care home if they're living in a care home. We can do it at the hospice, we can do it online. Um, we're quite flexible uh, in how we provide support. Probably says all that on this slide, but I can't read it. So you can self-refer or be referred by someone else with their permission. And it can be at all sorts of different places, yes, you yep. can decide. And it builds support writing and advanced statement about the decisions to refuse treatment and about lasting power of attorney. And uh, you're encouraged to uh, tell people about this and, uh, and also they will sign for which is one other organisation where you may be able to get help. Yeah. Thank you. So we provide support in completing those three tools that I mentioned earlier. But we also signpost people to um, other organisations that can help. One that people rarely think of up there is the Digital Legacy Association. Um, people increasingly have lots of information online. Some people have a Facebook account or an Instagram account. Some people have email addresses. Some people have lots of photos in various places. And that is really about what you do with everything that you have um, online, anything digital, what you want to do with it, you know, 
Do you want somebody to have your photographs? Do you want your Facebook account to be closed down? Do you want it to be memorialized? And things like that. So that's all included in our, our events statement as well. Um, and of course, Age UK, I'm sure you've heard of, and the Citizens Advice Bureau. Um, lots of organizations out there can give you help um, should you need any additional help. I'm just going to put these up. Um, benefits basically to people are, you know, it, 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 it provides peace of mind. Once you've done it, um, you know, it, 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 it is a relief. Um, it also unburdens your loved ones, your clinicians, because they know what you want, they don't have to second guess. Um, and I know that Andy was probably going to say a little bit about yeah. that afterwards. But we've, we've found the feedback that we have that people are very relieved once they've done it. We've, we've actually got some lovely stories from St Luke's um, about people. We have uh, we had one young man, and this kind of reinforces the, um, the thing about it not being for older people necessarily. Um, but we had a young man at the hospice who was only in his 20s. Um, he passed away before Christmas. And um, before he passed away, he wrote an advance care plan. He wrote down his wishes. Um, he was a Hindu, um, but he didn't want a traditional Hindu service. He didn't want to be cremated. He wanted a Christian burial. Um, and by writing down his wishes and making it clear to everybody and to his family what he wanted, his wishes were carried out to the letter. Um, we also helped him to write his own eulogy, um, which was really nice because it was really, you know, his personality shone out from that. And it was a relief for him, and it was a relief for his family to just know what he wanted and to be able to carry out his wishes. Um, we do have lots of stories like that. Um, you know, because we, we give palliative treatment to people, but like I said, we also support people in the community one lady that we did a, an advanced care plan for um, said that she wanted to do it simply because she had had to make some difficult decisions when her own parents were diagnosed with dementia and she didn't know what they wanted and she'd done the best she could um, in, in trying to work, you know, work that out. But she didn't want her own sons to have to you know, have the worry of not knowing what she wanted, so she was writing everything down and making sure that it was all clear. Um, this is just a bit about how it benefits the community as well. It's a great service. It's not a service that I've ever heard of before in the community. Um, there are various tools online in different places that you can use, but I haven't heard of a service where people will actually come out and help you do it, um, which is what we do at St Luke's. Um, one important thing is um, that you need to share it if you do do it. And those places on the slide are all the sorts of places you should share it with. Unfortunately, there is no one or singing or dancing repository that we can put things like this. Um, we don't have joined up systems in the NHS. Um, so my advice would be to give it to everybody who needs to know, to your friends, your family, clinicians. Um, I use a patient portal called Patients Know Best, where you can upload things like this. Um, yeah, London Ambulance Service, there is a UCP is, um, Urgent Care Plan is a new Pan London system where information is shared. Um, so, you know, wherever you can share it, to, to be absolutely sure that should anything happen, your wishes will be respected and observed. I'm afraid you're going to have to read again. Okay, so, so if you can tell people throughout the community about this service, um, but also there's, uh, you've got some leaflets with you that people can take away, which uh, will, will help give, give more information. And, uh, if we have any events where we can raise awareness, because I know you've come into our coffee morning and so on, and, and, and also talk about it with your family and friends. Um, yeah. 
And there's the contact details, which I'm sure all this will be on the leaflet as well. It is, yeah. So, uh, so that's great. So, yeah, I, I have to say, one of the reasons I kind of invited Galena along this morning was because uh, whenever I was speaking to her about it, I was kind of conscious of how often um, I come to do funerals and things for people, and quite often their family don't really know what they want. And sometimes I can't even really help because I, because I don't always know the person I'm doing the funeral for either. And, you know, so they, they, you know, there might be something simple and they don't even know, they don't know what hymns their friend liked or their mother liked or their father liked. And so many different aspects, you know. Um, I, I once went to visit a family and the only thing I could say about the mother was, she never complained. <laughs> Which isn't much to build a service around, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, uh, yeah. So, so I think it's you know this to me it, it struck me as something that was very very relevant, and I think you know you said that you, know, you can access this by contacting you on on the email or by the phone number on Tuesdays to Thursdays. A free service, which in these sort of cost times, I think is uh, is quite important. But it's one that you know it can be done wherever you need it to be done. So it can be done at home. It can be done sort of in church anywhere. It's a bit private. You can you can come and you can get it done. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much for coming along. You're so, very welcome. And thank you very much. If you stay for coffee and. Uh, I'm sure people can come in through the, the organ people come in and get leave that's nothing and uh, I'm sure so they will I'll, I'll be having a coffee afterwards. Um, I'm not usually up at about this early on a Sunday morning, I have to admit. Um, and please come and see me and get a leaflet and seriously have to think about doing it because I've done mine and I feel so much better having done it. Um, yeah, because I don't want to burden my friends or family for not knowing what I want. Um, I had to go through the same thing with my parents. They didn't know what they wanted. Um, yeah. And it's so much better if you do it this way. Thank you. Are there any questions before? Stone silence, that's good. Is that a good thing, Andrew? I think you've covered everything, so <laughs> or, or maybe, they want, maybe they don't want us all to know what they're asking and we'll come and ask you later. Okay. Thank you for listening, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Karina. Let's give Karina a round of applause. Let's pray. Lord, you are here with us, and we ask that you might help us to hear what you would have to say to us. We are here, we let us out. In Jesus' name, Amen. There are certain words which they don't necessarily mean anything bad of themselves, but they're often used in quite a negative way. I'll give you an example I want to talk about. One of my favourite programmes is the programme Yes Minister or Yes Prime Minister. You know, uh, it, was, it was all more in the 80s and 90s. And there was one episode where Sir Humphrey Appleby, the, the senior civil servant, manages to stop the minister in his tracks simply by describing one of his policy initiatives as courageous. Yes, courageous. Yeah, you know, it could cost you votes to that, and they suddenly doesn't want to do it. But another such word is the word extravagant. Most of the time when we suggest someone was extravagant, we, were, we are really saying, I wouldn't have spent that on that. And I hear figures say, say that some people spend on their weddings. I think, good grief, that would have been a decent deposit on a house. <laughs> or I watch Top Gear. And I see them driving around in these supercars, and I think, who would spend that on a car? Have they never heard of depreciation? The shirt I'm wearing today was bought from a Dutch company online during lockdown. 
And I have a friend from the Netherlands. And when I bought it, I thought, oh, I bought a shirt from the Netherlands. And she says, oh, what good is the company? And I told her, and she says, oh, that's quite extravagant. And I thought, well, I'm a bit shocked. She said, no, 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 it's just that they're, they're actually famous for having quite large shirts. You know, I said, thanks, my flamboyant. But she says, I don't really know how much they cost. But maybe she did. I don't know. But there's a, but there's a couple of things about extravagance. One is that it's actually quite subjective. I have a friend who has an office, and if you went into his office, it looks like the bridge on the Starship Enterprise. There's so much tech there. He spent a fortune on the stuff. And I ask him, do you really need all of that? And he'll say, well, yeah, that's what I enjoy. Other people will spend it on holidays, for example. And that hints at something else about extravagance. When we express our surprise at what someone has spent on something, we tend to express it in terms of what else they could have done with the money. You spent five grand on a new telly? You could have been that kitchen, right? Yeah. And, um, and when we do that, we're kind of expressing what our priorities are. The, the last comment that, that was said suggested, you think that food, and having a nice kitchen is more important than being able to watch Ireland win the Grand Slam on the latest extra super ultra higher than ever definition television. <laughs> and sometimes, but they don't, sometimes it's not always a bad thing, sometimes we might actually want people to be extravagant. There was a story a few years ago of a man who was kidnapped in New York. And the kidnapper sent a ransom note to his wife in which they demanded a hundred thousand dollars if she wanted to see her husband alive. And she did pay a ransom, but not before she talked the kidnappers down to thirty thousand. <laughs> <laughs> and you gotta wonder how that how that conversation went. A hundred thousand for him? Who do you think he is? George Clooney? Have you seen his beer guts? Have you followed him into the bathroom? I'll give you 30,000 final offer, deal or no deal. And in the end, the man was returned on harm. The kidnappers were caught. The money was returned and so on. But you've got to wonder how he felt when he found out his wife had paid enough down price to get him back. <laughs> And I'd like to think that if we were in a similar situation, Jules would spare no expense to get me back in. <laughs> she wouldn't haggle at the price and say, can I think about that? <laughs> well, this morning we read of a woman who was determined to honor Jesus, and she was very extravagant about doing it. No expense spared. And we, and we also see that kind of question of the expense, and what are her priorities? And there's that kind of looking on and thinking, what else she could have done with her money? As John tells it, the incident occurs on the evening before Jesus rides into Jerusalem on what we would call as Palm Sunday, and we'll look at next week. He's, be, he's about to be healed as a king, and at the start of the week, it's the start of the week which will culminate in his crucifixion. And they're at dinner, presumably they're at Mary and Martha's because Martha's serving. Lazarus is there, which must have given the uh, evening an extra dimension because it must have. You know, when you've been with someone who recovers from a serious illness, you know, you might, you know, you might, you, and you wondered if you'd ever see them again. You know, the fact that you get the chance, you know, it gives you a sense of what it would be like. Except Lazarus hadn't actually been ill, he'd actually been dead for four days. And I'm pretty sure his advanced care plan hadn't included being dead for four days. <laughs> and then suddenly, I'd, from outside the dining circle, Mary takes a bottle of perfume and pours it over his feet. And not just a dribble, a full pint of the stuff. And then very much against the convention of the day, she lets down her hair and uses that to run the perfume into his feet. And the sweet aroma of the perfume fills the room, where it jostles for position alongside the slightly embarrassed tension of the match. Mm, I don't know what's going on here, kind of glances. And, and it's not spoken, but I wonder if Martha feels a little bit poo out that after all her efforts she's being upstaged by Mary again. And then Judas speaks up and effectively says, What a waste! Does she not know what that's worth? If she didn't want it, why didn't she just sell it and give it to the poor? 
And however his motives are interpreted, I'm pretty certain that Judas wasn't the only one thinking that. And Jesus' response is quite cryptic. Leave her alone. This perfume was supposed to be saved for my burial. And then he goes on to say, you're always going to have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. Now, taken in isolation, Jesus commented about the poor. It seems quite selfish or even callous. Certainly, I've heard people use the poor you will always have with you as an excuse to do nothing. To say, well, what's the point in even trying to do anything about poverty? It's a never-ending job. There will always be poor people. But it takes a very selective approach to the life and teaching of Jesus to suggest that that is what he meant. Jesus said he had come to bring good news to the poor. He and his followers carried an alms barrel. As it, as when he died, his material legacy, which, you know, the material less than a week after the incident we shared this morning, it amounts to no more than the clothes he has on his back. And once more, the background of this passage was Passover. If you know the way at Christmas we tend, you know, it, it tends to be much easier to do kind of charitable stuff sort of around Christmas, you know, people were sort of, you know, the charities and stuff like that. Well, Passover was a bit like that for Jews. It was a time when there would be an official offering for the poor at the temple. And although John tells us at the, of Jesus' ulterior motives, at surface level, when, G when Jesus was talking about the perfume being given to the poor, he's not generally involved in you could have found a poor person and given it. He's actually referring to this specific collection. We could have sold this, we could have, going up to the temple, we could have made an offering to this specific thing. But Jesus doesn't actually just come up with this quote off the top of his head. It's a quote from the book of Deuteronomy. And it points in the opposite direction to the way it's sometimes used. It's about cancelling debt and alleviating poverty. The sense of the Deuteronomy passage was that God had been generous to them when he released them from slavery. So they should be generous to others. And it was an acknowledgement that because there would always be poor among them, that the work of alleviating poverty would and should never be done. It was actually designed as a warning to counteract what we euphemistically just call today compassion fatigue. And nonetheless, Jesus' comments are designed to defend Mary against the charge that she has somehow got her priorities mixed up. What might that say to us? What shifted her priorities? And what might that say to us, particularly in the season of Lent? See, crises do have a way of getting us to rearrange our priorities. We've probably seen all those films where one of the lead characters never makes it home to the kids' school play. He's quite happy to tread on top of everyone to get to the top of his company. It's quite often then. And then disaster strikes, they hit the bottom, and they suddenly realize all the things that are really, really important to them. And he promises, oh, if I come out the other side of this, I'll do it all differently. And one such crisis is an awareness of mortality. Although it wasn't necessarily planned as such, it's appropriate that we have Linda here today, because Linda here today, because it encourages us to at least consider our own mortality. And sometimes when people do face a life-threatening illness or situation, it can rearrange their priorities. It might not always make it a completely positive thing. For example, there is a high rate of divorce amongst couples in which one partner has suffered from a serious illness. It causes them to emerge with a new sense of purpose or urgency. You might remember a couple of weeks ago, and this, this is probably about as close a brush to fame as I'm ever going to get, uh, at the Oscars, 
a film from Northern Ireland called, won an award called An Irish Goodbye. And James, the guy here in the middle, went to school with one of my nephews, so that's as close as I get to fame. But it focused on, their, on these two brothers trying to work their way through their deceased mother's bucket list, stuff that she had wanted to do before she kicked the bucket. And I want to suggest to you that both the shift of priorities and that sense of urgency were true of Mary. An awareness of mortality and the effect it had on Mary pervades our reading this morning. And at one level, it's quite straightforward. She's the sister of Lazarus, who just a matter of a few verses ago had been raised from the dead by Jesus. From her perspective, her brother had been dead and was way, way beyond hope. Lazarus hadn't just been ill when Jesus had shown up. He'd been dead for days. And yet Jesus had returned her brother to him. What value could you place on that? Surely like the guy in the kidnap story with which I began, you couldn't put a price on that. It goes way beyond should he use 50 mils or 100 mils on his feet. From Mary's perspective, Judas would have been no, nothing but someone who, no, you, you talk about people who know the price of everything and the value of nothing. How much is enough to honor someone who has done that for her? And that might have shifted the priorities. But there's another sort of darker sense in which mortality broods over this passage. One that may introduce a sense of urgency into her actions. Each of the four Gospels tell a variation of this story, and all of them, bar Luke, have Jesus point explicitly towards his death and burial. In part, the way John sets up the story creates that brilliant shadow. It's bracketed first by a plot and arrest to kill Jesus, and then, because Lazarus had not unreasonably become a local celebrity, there was even a plot to kill Lazarus too. And within that little scene, the brooding shadow of death is present. The Passover of which Jesus will be crucified is in sight. It's only six days away. Jesus is in Bethany, a village which lies in the shadow of Jerusalem. It's a mere two, three miles away. It's the final stopping point on the road to Jerusalem where Jesus is going to be crucified. And after that, Jesus' direct reference to his burial sin and saying that they will not always have him with them. And a sense that amongst well, one level should have been a celebration of the life of Lazarus, it's actually shot through with darkness. And we don't know to what extent people around that table realized that Jesus' life was in danger. But it's hard to believe they had no sense of it. And what's more, as Matthew and Luke might admit to the story, the triumphal story would happen the next day, and it's a premeditated act. Jesus has raised the donkey. He sends two disciples ahead of him to pick up the donkey. And, and Jesus doesn't see this. He just goes straight to Jerusalem. And you know, then Jesus, it's a there, there's going to be a plot to kill him. And rather than just trying to hide away, Jesus floats us up the street and says, here I am. He's arranged to pick up a donkey in the region in which this story takes place. But before he does it, as John, he stops to have a last meal with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And as a result, they probably know exactly what Jesus is planning to do next. And they're also aware how it's likely to be received. And it's not unreasonable to say that Mary wants to honor Jesus <coughs> because this might be the last chance she has to do it. Her extravagant worship is performed in the shadow of death. If she doesn't do it now, she never will. And that awareness of mortality shifts her priorities and her sense of urgency. The poor she could help any time. And she had no reason to assume that she did. But she wasn't always going to have Jesus. What does this have to do with us?
us, and why, apart from the fact that the sensor of the curse is so close to the crucifixion, are we pointed towards it in Lent? As Galina has said this morning, mortality is a bit of a taboo subject. The mere fact that I guarantee at least some people are sat here going, good grief, I could hear a bit, bit, bit more than in the press and the storm. And there's testimony of that. And even as Christians, we can live to the fact that we are Easter people, we are about resurrection, but we can't overlook the fact that resurrection reaches us via the cross. And as, just as we celebrate Easter at a time when new life is springing up from the earth, so for us in the northern hemisphere at least, let comes at a time of deadness and it's designed to direct us towards it. Yes, we can face it in the light of the promise of the resurrection, but the season retains its emphasis on mortality. It starts with Ash Wednesday and people, some, in some traditions will have the cross marked on their head in ash, reminding us that we are dust, and we will return to dust. And yet it's not designed to leave us depressed and despairing, but to shift our priorities and awaken in us our sense of urgency. For something that is true of life is that there are things that you can do at any time, and that's fair enough, but there are some things which, callings which we will never fulfill unless we grasp the chance when it comes our way. We can, we can catch a vision in a moment to do something fine and generous, and then we procrastinate. We leave it till tomorrow, and it passes, and it's left on that. Life is often uncertain, and if we don't seize the moment God gives us, things might never be found. Back in the early 90s, there's a, there's a, there's a film out currently about this. Um, back in the early 90s, uh, the rock band U2 were doing a really big tour around the world. And uh, it had massive big screens all around the place. Uh, and, the, uh, and, and part of their concert in the 90s was that they would interview people living in Sarajevo at the heart of the war that was breaking up what was then Yugoslavia. People said, what? Why? Why are you doing that? Why are you putting a dampener on a concert like that? And he said he didn't want his children when they grew up saying, Daddy, when that was going on, you had a voice of millions of people listening to you. You could have drawn attention to ethnic cleansing. What did you do with your voice? And he didn't want his answer to be nothing. And that sense of urgency that is around today if this generation doesn't tackle climate change. We get the warnings. If we don't act now, it'll be too late. And for us, it might not be on such a grand scale. But for Paul, as Paul tells us in Ephesians, God has something for each one of us to do. And then to direct us towards the reality that there will come a time when our part to do it, when our, when our chance to do it will pass us by. And then we need to seize the moment that God has given us. And then calls us to reshape our priorities, to awaken our urgency to the task that God has given us. But if today we hear his voice, we mustn't harden our hearts because it might not come again. But turning to this passage in Lent, it was even beyond that, and points towards a reason to, like Mary, be extravagant in our worship. Just as the shadow of Christ's crucifixion hangs over the passage we have shared this morning, in this season we are taken to the cross and we are reminded of the extravagance of the love of God, of the lengths to which God was prepared to go to reach us, so that we, 
to live in the shadow of death, need to fear no evil, but, but could place our trust in the new life God has for us. But we're also promised that the God whom we worship has gone before us and promises to bring us through, to raise us to new life. As How much is too much to offer in return for a love like God's? Where's the peace be with you? <coughs> We're going to sing again. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One.
hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our Lord received Mary's offering, so let us come before God our Father and offer our prayers for the world, knowing that he will hear. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do offer you our thanks, praise and love, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who gave himself for us. Thank you for your church, which you sustain with your powerful, life-giving work. Bless your church throughout the world, that all your people may celebrate the coming days of the, the Holy Week in Easter that will come in the next week or so, with true faith and devotion. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. You accepted the service of Martha, the friendship of Lazarus, and the devotion of Mary. So bless your people everywhere who serve you in all kinds of different ways. For those who serve in the church, for those who serve in the home, for those who serve in the workplace, for school, students and school children who serve by learning for the future. For those who volunteer their services in the community, and today we particularly pray for the work of St. Mike's. We pray for those who offer friendship, for those who pray, fast, or give generously of their time and money, for those who befriend the disadvantaged and those who mothers avoid, and for those whose work is dangerous. Bless the service of all your people and assure them that you are well pleased with their work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Show your kindness to those who serve you in similar ways but do not yet know you or that they know that they are doing it for you. Reward them with your grace. Open their eyes to see you. Grant them faith, hope, and love. But we also pray that you speak to the consciences of those who plan evil. Show them that honesty is better than falsehood, that peace is better than violence. Give to our political leaders and citizens alike a deep commitment to goodness, integrity, mutual well-being. Keep us all from the greed and false compassion of Judas. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your son drew close to Lazarus and raised him from the dead. Feed me of those whom we know who are close to death and grant them faith in you. Strengthen those who are preparing for the death of a loved one, that they may make the most of the time left for them. And we pray for all those who work amongst those who are having to face their mortality, for doctors, nursing staff, chaplains, volunteers, who work in hospices, nursing homes, and hospitals. And we pray for those who are in mourning at this time. We pray particularly for the Beckwith family and pray that Timothy's funeral in the next couple of weeks will go well. Be with them in their time of mourning. Heavenly Father, Mary honoured the Lord with her gift of perfume. May we honour you in our lives by honouring all who are in thee. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we take up our offering.
Lord, we offer it back to you, what you've given to us. May we use it to bring you glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing song this morning is, My Jesus, My Savior, Lord, there is none like you. <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go with you. Amen.